Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Today I wanted to combine the leftover black shiny brocade from the puffy sleeved jacket I made earlier in the year here on the channel with another brocade that has been languishing in my stash. You know you've had a fabric in your stash for far too long when you grab it from fabric.com and they no longer exist. And I wanted to combine these two fabrics together because I've had a design kicking around in my brain for a little while now, trying to create an almost faux corset sort of blocked, color blocked section in the middle of a dress using a horizontal style line. Now you may have seen me use horizontal style lines in my Blade Runner dress ages and ages ago, but I did leave side darts in the bodice on that one when I just don't need them. We can do a horizontal princess seam. I don't know why I didn't think of how to close up all the dart fullness that first time. Someone actually mentioned it in the comments and I pinned that comment because correct, you do not need that dart fullness. I could have eliminated it and I'll show you how today over on the blue patterning table of doom as always. I'm starting with some alphanumeric paper and my little sketch here and of course my bodice block front. I'll go ahead and trace a copy of that including the dart information because I will need to move these darts around quite a bit today. I'm going to be eliminating them entirely. Basically this is a princess seam once again, it's just a different princess seam. It's more of a style line. It's a princess seam without a name, just like the one that goes up into the neckline, like my favorite uh, princess seam that I use so often here. I'll go ahead and hinge open both my darts here, just connecting my dart legs all the way up to the apex and slicing down those so that I can hinge these at the apex. I'll go ahead and close the side dart for now, just so I can show you what all this dart fullness looks like down here at the waist, just smooth this off. So if I had all of my dart fullness down here in one dart at the waist, this is my personal dart fullness, how much I need to make the fit uh, work here on my bodice, make the bodice into the cone shape that I need for my personal shape. I'll go ahead and draw a line up into the shoulder and move all this dart fullness up here for now, just so I can have a smooth waist and get all of my dart fullness like away from the bottom half of the garment. So I can draw in the style line I want with a completely smooth waist area. Hopefully you'll see what I mean. I'm going to true a guideline 90 degrees out from the apex uh, to the center front here. I'm going to come up about five eighths of an inch from there for my style line today. And I am going to be making a mock-up of this today just so that I can refine exactly where I want this line to fall on my body so that this looks a little bit like the top line of a uh, like overbust or mid bust corset in the end. Now once I cut along my intended style line here, I can tape the dart fullness back together along the shoulder and you can see exactly where that dart fullness has gone, except for instead of using it as a dart, we're going to be using it as a style line. So. Uh, after taking it all away, I've basically put it back where some of it started. Hopefully you can understand what's happening with the dart manipulation here today. Now this top piece is kind of a nasty shape right now. As I'm standing here working on this, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be interesting to sew together. I hope this works. Part of the reason I decided to go ahead and make a mock-up. I've actually never done this exact style line before. So, you know, whenever I do something completely new to me, I like to try and, uh, you know, avoid mistakes as much as I can when it comes to my final fabric. So I actually did do a little quick mock-up for this today in muslin and I decided to lower my style lines. So you can see in the green marker that I drew directly on the muslin while I had it on my body because I want this style line from the apex to come down further along the side seam. So I'll just go ahead and mark that here on my pattern after I have it taped back together so that I can transfer that onto my pattern from the muslin here. Luckily this means my uh, pattern piece in the top here, the top half of my bodice, it's going to be a nicer shape. It comes out being less pointy right at the apex which is kind of I don't know, it just feels nicer because it looked so weird before. And I do need to readjust and add seam allowance back in here because I had taped this closed, uh, you know, of course, eliminating seam allowance again. So I need to add that back on here because of course I still need to sew this back together. And I'll have the two pieces for my front bodice ready to go. And you can still see where that dart fullness that I need is hiding in this pattern. It's still there in some ways. It's just being contained by this style line instead. And I hadn't done anything to modify this neckline yet. So let's go ahead and lower this into a tall little V here. I do kind of wish I had taken this down another half inch, but uh, I do like a high V. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Lots of room for brooches, as I always say. And I did have a particular brooch of mine in mind to wear with this dress in the end, so you'll see that much later on. But for now, let me go ahead and trace a copy of my bodice block back, again, including all relevant information, including the dart. And then we can draw in the style line back here. I'm gonna use the front as a guide to mark that in along the side seam and then kind of give me a guideline along the center back for how tall I want this to come up. I really want to uh, have this again come through the point of the dart on this side, just like I came through the apex on the front. That means I'll be able to eliminate this dart fully. And this will be my back and the lower back like so. Make sure that the neckline is still gonna match up here along the shoulder and then I can cut this out. And once again, I will need to add seam allowance along the style line here once I cut it apart. As we know, like so, cut up to the dart point, shift that closed, 
like so. And once again, you can see where the dart fullness is gone. It's pretty much into a side dart-ish, but really into the style line in general. Just using style lines to obtain the same fit as my darts would have given me in the first place. How to use dart fullness as a seam instead, basically. If you've watched my princess seam video, then you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you can see it here. Now I wanted to use a similar tulip sleeve to the one I used in my last dress for my last video here on the channel. So I'm just tracing the top half of my sleeve block here again, and I'm going to come out only about two inches uh, as opposed to, I think I did two and a half or three last time. So this will only overlap two inches up here at the shoulder. And I made this sleeve around nine inches long. Once again, I still think I need to bring this up. So that is something I'll have to keep in mind for next time. Now, instead of coming in a half inch or a quarter inch, I actually tipped this sleeve out a quarter inch. And in fact, I still think I need to tip this out even further because I want more movement in this sleeve in the end. So really refining exactly what I want for this style of tulip sleeve I've been working with recently. But I will go ahead and cut this out. That way I can cut this first side apart and then layer this closed along the underarm seam here. Do I remember to add a quarter inch onto the other side? Ooh, I do. Excellent. <laughs> Before I layer this closed along the seam allowance here, layer the underarm seam closed like so. And I've put some extra paper here on the other side so that I can flip this over and have a guideline for where this curve needs to be on this other side, like so. I'll need to redraw in my center line of my sleeve so I have a compass point to know where the heck I am. There we go. And again, two inches out on this side, follow that same curve down like so. And now I have this giant strange whale tail shaped sort of tulip sleeve like so. So when this goes on, it would look like this. And that does have quite a lot of coverage over the arm. So I'm going to take actually five eighths of an inch off of the hem of this on either side before I add in my pleats. Now this time, instead of having one between the center and the edge and uh, one at the center, I'm going to do the center and then have the second pleat towards the underarm instead. So I'm bringing that out further. A very similar technique that you saw me use adding pleats to my sleeve last time I did this. However, I'm just going to move them back along the edge of the sleeve further away from the overlap, I guess, further away from the shoulder tip. So I'll have one pleat that's right here at the center of my sleeve. Go ahead and make that two and a half inches of fullness here for both of these pleats today. Plenty of extra width being added in here. And of course, this is going to make my sleeve cap all sorts of funny up here. So kind of smooth that together, but I'll try and bring it down as much as I can while slicing these. So I have the correct shape along my pleat excess here, like so. Pleat the second pleat closed. Pleat, pleat your pleats like so. And technically that tiny bit of raise at the top of the sleeve cap would mean that the sleeve is a little, has a little bit of extra ease going into the arm side, but a sleeve always has a little bit of extra ease going into the arm side. So I'm not worried about it actually, because this is enough that it won't make a giant difference. So when this is pleated down, we have some volume on this side of the sleeve. That was the uh, front side there. Let me do the same for the back on this other side here. Again, hopefully you understand what's going on. If not, check out my last dress video, Iridescent Velvet Lace Dress that I made here on the channel recently. If you want to see me kind of construct the first version of this particular sleeve style, and then of course this is just a tulip sleeve, and I have a whole video about those as well, if you'd like to uh, check it out on the uploads page. But I'll trim my pleats that same way on this other side as well. Pleated long tulip sleeve, 2024, correct. But I'm actually not done yet. I am going to go ahead and modify my skirt pattern today as well. Take a tracing of my basic skirt front here with its darts, and I'm going to draw in a skirt yoke. Um, I'll use the, again, top corsety section as a guide for this, and then draw in this front curve here, making sure that it, again, passes through my dart points, or at least within like a half inch of the dart point on either of these. The most important fit dart in life is going to be the bust dart, but these ones on the skirt, I feel like you can fudge around with them a tiny bit more than you can on the bodice. So I uh, give myself a tiny bit, like a three eighths of an inch of leeway with that longer first dart here, but I'm going to cut this curved style line away. And then I can layer my darts closed here on the yoke as well, just like I did for the style lines in the bodice. Same sort of idea here eliminating this dart fullness. And it's now a part of this style line seam here for the skirt yoke instead. And I'll need to add seam allowance for that so that I can sew these back together for both the skirt yoke and the skirt itself, of course. Tape down my floops as always, like so. All right, so now I have my front skirt done. 
convert it into a yoked pencil skirt, basically. And I'll do the same here for my back, grabbing my pencil skirt back pattern or my skirt block back pattern. Same thing. A skirt block is basically a pencil skirt. And I, you've seen me use it as such quite often. I'm going to have this curve actually a little bit less here in the back. I'm keeping the width at the side and the center back consistent for my yoke back here, which means while I'll be able to close my darts along the yoke, I will still have a little bit of dart fullness here in my skirt as well. And I will combine that into one dart along the back of this, as opposed to having two absolutely minuscule darts, I'll have one quite small dart. And again, I will need to add seam allowance down here. So I can go ahead and do that while I'm closing up this dart here. So I'm just gonna measure what I have left and I'll eliminate the one that's closer to the center back just by adding that same amount of fullness to either side of the other dart. So uh, I'm taking this quarter inch and adding an eighth of an inch onto either side of the other dart leg over here. That way I can just sew this one tiny dart in the back of each side of my skirt. And we have our seam allowance ready to go here, like so. And close the darts up on this back yoke piece as well. Layer those shut, add seam allowance, and then the skirt pattern will be finished as well. Now I am going to be cutting this out of, yes, black sparkly brocade, like I mentioned, and then a different brocade for the kind of corset shaped midsection, both the skirt yokes and the bodice piece below the bust to the waist. That way it kind of, again, it looks like a mid bust corset that I'm wearing over a dress. And you'll see what I mean as we move on. And then I will cut everything out of an acetate lining as well, which you won't be seeing for a very long time. And yes, this sort of cross hatched, almost mid-century modern, gold and champagne and grayish pearly colored and black brocade was actually a fabric.com purchase several years ago so i'm sorry i can't tell you where you can get any fabric like this the website where i bought it no longer exists and i'm going to use some light to mid weight fusible interfacing on again those sort of corsety ish pieces the skirt yokes and then the bust to waist pieces for the bodice. So I'll cut all of those out of interfacing as well. Now I do think this is where I might uh, um, lose a few of you because I think uh, many people would think that this cross hatched fabric was pretty enough and had enough going on all on its own. But of course I decided to add HTVBs, cicadas, shield beetles, spiders, etc. Uh, various entomological touches into this brocade because I can't find brocades that have a bug print. So I might as well just turn this brocade into one that has a bug print. And this vinyl actually, it looks pretty much just ivory in the end, but it is actually a pearl finished ivory. It's just extremely subtle. So I wish it was a little bit more sparkly or metallic in some way, but we make it work by adding a billion sequins later, I promise. So yes, I know many of you would prefer this probably without the bugs, but since this dress is for me, myself and I, I'm adding bugs on, no one is surprised. Let me go ahead and interface all these pieces before the brocade starts to fray apart on me. Part of the reason I decided to stabilize these with interfacing was to help with fraying because I am going to be doing so much sequining on the back of these. Um, give that a little bit more stability for the embroidery work, if we can call sequining that, um, which I'm gonna be doing about halfway through this project. So you'll see that later, but I wanted to give this a little bit more strength and you'll see I actually run this through the serger as well because look at these raw edges. They already want to fray apart. The curse of metallic fabrics sometimes is that they don't always have structural integrity along the edges. Now, the only regret I have about this project is that I interfaced these centerpieces, again, giving them a little bit more structure, both for please don't fray apart of me reasons, and also because if this was extra hard and smooth, it would kind of add to the corsety look that I was kind of after with this dress design in general. But my only regret is that I didn't interline the black brocade for the rest of the dress, which would have helped the uh, weight of that brocade match up with this one at the waist a little bit better because now this waist brocade is a little bit uh, stiffer than the black brocade I'll be using for the rest of the dress. Yeah, it's things I only really learned by completing the project really. But yes, I cut out a bunch of bugs using my Cameo machine and this HTV and decided where to put them, different sizes of things, little beetles, big spiders, little spiders, a couple of cicadas, just for funsies. You know me, I just can't help myself. That's right. So there's that. And I'm just using the iron, of course, to secure these down. Uh, whenever using a different type of HTV vinyl, make sure to do a test piece first. That's what you saw me doing earlier, uh, making sure that this vinyl would stick to this brocade and seeing you know, exactly how much heat I need to use, how long I needed to leave them. In the end, I actually hit this from the other side a little bit, just so that these would really stick on here, like so. I could, of course, also have used flock. I think that would have been really pretty with this as well, or a different color. I was keeping the kind of color scheme of this brocade consistent for this whole project, so I didn't introduce any new colors in here just keeping with the kind of pearl as the lightest shade of the grays and champagnes and light golds that are already a part of this brocade but i was just sprinkling my bugs on 
no surprise there. And I did hold the different pieces up to one another so I could make sure to distribute the bugs like evenly or randomly actually so that I didn't end up with like two cicadas right next to each other or, or like two bees really close to one another um, in awkward ways. So I wanted to make sure that they were evenly sprinkled all about the pieces I intended them for. And I do have my tiny, tiny darts still to sew over here on my skirt pieces. So I'm just marking those with a gel pen so I can stitch those first. And once I have my skirt yoke all decorated with bugs here, I can go ahead and sew the black skirt pieces onto that. The front doesn't have any extra darts, so I can just sew this curve onto the yoke curve here. Of course, both of these pieces were cut with the center front along the fold of the fabric, so they are mirrored like so. And I can go ahead and pin this a couple of times to make sure that my curves are laying nicely with one another for this yoke seam on my skirt. and I can pin the back skirt yokes as well. I sewed the tiny, tiny dart off camera. You'll have to forgive me. I mean, it was a tiny, tiny dart. How many times have you so seen me sew a dart here on the channel? A great many. This one was just very small. So just imagine me sewing a very small dart. And I can actually start sewing the style lines on the bodice as well. So I have my back pieces here again, all HTV'd, ready to go in that sense. I will sequin them in a moment. I also searched the raw edges of this fabric because again, it also wanted to fray. I can pin my convex and concave curves together here. They are quite strained, so you see me tapping the fabric and patting it with my fingers to make sure everything uh, is aligning in the weave and not stretching out in any weird ways in any area here. And I'll of course use a lot of pins as I am often wont to do. I'll put in a new fresh Microtex needle here over on the 99K, just because any brocade with Lurex threads, those highly metallic threads, tends to require a very sharp needle over here on the machine. So that's why you see me pulling my pins out today as well. It's because I do not want to dull this needle at all. I need it as sharp as possible. So new needle and no pins, sadly. Even when I'm using brocade, I usually will like sew over the pins when I'm doing, like setting in a sleeve or something, especially because that's usually later in the project and I'm less worried about dulling the needle at that point. But as we know, I have no problem sewing over pins normally. And that is mostly because this iron machine has no problem with pins. If you have a modern machine, it's probably more sensitive to sewing over pins. But we all know that 99 does not care. Sadly, Lurex brocades do. Although I did have an idea this morning for a new dress I want to make out of cotton sateen with HTV vinyl. And I really hope I have time to make that this weekend. I really don't. My schedule's pretty packed. But we'll see because I'm very excited about this idea that just came to mind. Of course, this morning I was watching an Armani show. And the colors actually on the screen made me think, oh, what if I use that one kind of HTV vinyl? And so I had an idea that looked nothing like the fashion show I was watching, but that's just how watching fashion shows works for me. Sometimes I'll just get inspired by one little thing like, oh, I didn't think about combining that color in that way or um, doing embellishments in a certain way or layering fabrics actually, especially with Armani, because oftentimes he will layer a print or a sparkly fabric underneath layers of sheer stuff. And it creates these really cool effects. Once again, Armani, not always my favorite silhouettes, but so many good ideas going on there. But with all those many curved seams sewn, I can now of course clip those curves. It's me after all, and I'll press them into place. I'm gonna press all the seam allowance up into the uh, like secondary brocade area. So on the skirt, I'm pressing them up into the yoke and on the bodice, I'll press them down into the um, like bust to waist piece, I suppose. Again, hopefully you know where I am when we get to it. But I'm actually going to gradate my seam allowances here just to avoid bulk. So I'm cutting the seam allowance on this side down to a quarter inch. That way it's kind of like a slope, a little ramp, as opposed to just a big bulky chunk of seam allowance in here. But I'll press that up as much as I can, try and get this to behave. And then I'm actually going to run some edge stitching on this just because it didn't want to behave. And because I'm going to be covering this in sequins later anyway, you won't really see this edge stitching. So let me just put a little bit of this down in here to hold the seam allowance up towards the top of the yoke. So the seam allowance is all underneath my left hand here. And that's what the stitching is going to be holding down, basically. It's like under stitching and edge stitching are very similar. And I used to get them confused. But in this case, edge stitching, because we're right along the edge and it is visible. Under stitching is 
underneath the edge almost turned inside and therefore not visible. But I will do this same preparation for everything. So I've clipped all my corners, graded the seam allowances, pressed those into place, and then I'll just run them through for this edge stitching. The only other thing is that because this is kind of a top stitching-ish dealio, I didn't use my regular 12 stitches per inch. I did size this up to 10 stitches per inch. So just a little bit larger stitch length for this because I think it tends to look nicer. That's right. Still focusing on my skirt pieces here because everything is sewn together, I can now stitch my side seams for these. So I'll line up the style line of the yoke along the side seams and then stitch these together all along the sides. Again, just using black Guterman all-purpose thread, which yes, I do go through a lot of that in my sewing room. I try and remember to order a spool whenever I place an order from anywhere that sells it, just so that I never run out. The things I never can have enough of, black Guterman thread and black zippers in both dress and skirt length, because we all know I love me some black fabric or at least very dark fabric, which both of these things would work for. I can never have too much black thread here in the sewing room. But I will again, press open my seam allowances, of course, over here on the ironing board. Luckily these curves aren't too harsh so I didn't need to clip them over the hip here. Just make sure those are behaving. Again using my hand as a uh, clapper <laughs> with the tailor's ham here. And finally back to working on the bodice here. I of course still need to sew the style line for the front here. So I'll line that up uh, making sure I lined up the center first and then the sides and then pinning in between. Again I've been saying this recently uh, I like to pin anchor points first match up notches as it were, and then pin in between to make sure everything is fitting down nicely. We can see what the backs looked like. Once again, I need to clip my curves, press all my seam allowance down where I want it, this time into the waist area. Once again, I will actually grade it that seam allowance as well, still trying to eliminate a little bit of bulk. And then I again will edge stitch this down into place. So I will sew that front style line here, the horizontal princess seam for lack of a better term, because that's, that's what's happening structurally. And I think sometimes, cause style lines can be structural or just for style reasons. So I almost like to call any style line that is controlling the fit, a princess seam to differentiate it from just a style line that is only there for a like a visual reason, as opposed to a functional reason. This is a functional, uh, fit inducing style line here. So that's why I like to call them princess seams, even if that would not be like the traditional name for them. I would just like to maintain some consistency for what I call things, whether it's correct or not, honestly. And I will clip, press and edge stitch this front seam as well. And then it was time to add hundreds, if not thousands of sequins. So I pulled out all of my white, clear, uh, sort of champagne-y colored sequins here. I didn't use any actually metallic sequins on this. Mostly I went for flat black and white sequins and then a color of sequin that's called Moon Glow, which is basically a clear plastic sequin with a almost shiny kind of Moon Glow reflective finish on it. So I can link Moon Glow sequins below there. Available from my favorite Cartwright sequins, of course. Not sponsored, but we all know that I um, <laughs> use a lot of their stuff because I just love a sequin and I love a flat sequin like this as well. And I am using a ton of different sizes of sequins here. Right now you see me sewing on size four sequins, but it doesn't really matter because I'm using all the way from a two millimeter, tiny, tiny, tiny vanilla colored sequin, um, which you can see at the top of the screen there. Um, so I'm gonna be using some of those, a lot of size fours in the white and the moon glow, and then all the way up to this really large size moon glow sequin. This is a size 10 sequin here. And I'm just stitching those on into uh, little lines and rows going over the different lines and kind of cross hatching of the design of the brocade itself. And then I'm going to fill in all the blank black space on this brocade with a sprinkling of black sequins as well. So sewing all the sequins on 
in rows, kind of paying attention to what's going on in the print of the brocade or the jacquard weave of the brocade, as it were. And then I will just sew random black sequins on, um, similar to how I'm doing the tiny, tiny two millimeter ivory sequins here over the kind of dot, this print in the fabric. I will just kind of use a, I think they call it a vermicelli pattern almost, uh, just randomly filling in space with sequins or beads. I will use that on the black areas later as well. And yes, it did take me about a week of, you know, five to eight hours a day of sequining uh, to do all the sequining for everything on this project. So it did take me a, quite a long time, but I do think it's very worth it in the end. And if you look very closely here, you can see that I did not sequin the area that will become seam allowance. So I just, uh, when you're working with sequin fabrics, you usually take the sequins and beads off of the area where the seam allowance will be. Um, in this case, because I was adding the sequins myself, I just left those areas blank. So I just didn't sequin all the way up to like the side seam, for example. So I could leave that area blank and wouldn't have to sew over sequins over here. But yes, I've lined up my shoulder seams and side seams for the bodice and I can finally stitch those together after all of that sequining work, which I normally do at the very end of my project, but this time I decided to go, go ahead and do it in the middle so that I could really sit down with each piece and completely coat those cross-tatched areas in sequins. Once my side seams and shoulder seams are sewn, I of course need to press those open. Whether the brocade believes in the idea or not, between my hands and the clapper and the tailor's ham, hopefully we can get everything to lie nice and smooth. And at this point I can finally stitch my waist seam. Let's go ahead and line those up. I'll line up again anchor points first. So the side seams and then in between or out to the edge in the case of the back. And then I can stitch that again back over here on the machine. Still have my half inch seam allowance going on. Still trying to remember to remove my pins. We'll see how it goes. And again, this area of seam allowance I had left free of sequins so that I don't have to sew and crunch over any plastic over here. Majorly unfortunate. And again, would definitely dull my needle if I had to sew over a sequin, that's for sure. If I think sewing too close to a pin is bad, sewing right through plastic, the needle is not gonna like that. And again, of course, I need to press open that seam allowance. So I'll go ahead and do that using my hands as a clapper for sure this time. The thing about a clapper is it's a solid piece of wood uh, that is not curved, whereas my hands can mold to whatever shape I need them to, you know? However, a clapper, the wood actually is absorbing steam and water out of the fabric. So a clapper is more useful. So perhaps what I need is wooden arms, but you know, we all make concessions in the studio. And once again, just like my last project, we have most of the dress together and yet I have not begun the sleeves. So let me grab those. And I did actually line these sleeves in black lining, as you can see here, whereas the rest of the dress will be lined in a sort of champagne-y, taupey gray acetate, just because of what I had in stock here in the stash. I uh, find it actually harder to find good lining fabric that I like compared to other things. Um, this black lining fabric here, I really liked it. It's a nice twill cupro uh, or cupro lining from mood, but they of course are out of stock of it now, so I can't get any more, which is a bummer because it was a almost a medium weight and much easier to use than a lot of other slippery, silky linings I've uh, come across in my time. So I'm sad that there is no more of it. I should have bought 12 yards when I had the chance, you know, but that kind of thing is an investment, but it's an investment in my and therefore the channel's future, right? So if I find great lining, I should buy more of it is the lesson that I will have to take away for next time. But just like how I finished the sleeves in the iridescent lace dress I made recently, I finished the hem of my sleeves that last time with a uh, lining of silk organza so I could maintain the transparency. This time I'm using this black lining. So I just sewed the curved hems together. I need to clip those and of course press those into place. I will actually then throw some understitching in here again as well to hold this lining folded to the inside. So I'm doing that here, using my presser foot as a guide to stitch about well, a little over 
one eighth of an inch perhaps away from the original stitching line. Again, the seam allowance is underneath my left hand here, underneath the fabric. So all the seam allowance is being stitched down to the lining side for my understitching here. It's harder to see what's going on if I do it from this direction, but it comes out smoother if I do it from the top like this. So apologies that you can't exactly see the seam allowance down there, but you'll have to believe me, it's there. And then I'll give those another good press. Then I need to line up the tops again, trim any excess that has occurred, and then baste uh, the top edge of this just into place. I did that by machine, but you could do it by hand as well. Just so that my pleats are all lined up in both the lining and outer layer. And then I will grab my pattern piece and mark where I need to pleat this down from the initial patterning stages of it all. I will mark the under arm seam or where it would have been here as well, because I need to line that up with the side seam of my bodice in the dress itself. Once I go to set these in the dress, but put a pin up here where each pleat needs to come together and then I will pinch these pleats. Again, the fullness of the pleat is sticking out towards the middle of my arm and therefore the pleat opens up towards the underarm. Uh, I think this is how the Airdem sleeves that originally inspired me to try this sort of sleeve style. I think this is how they're doing theirs. Of course, I haven't been able to inspect a dress in person. Perhaps I should just go on a field trip down to the, the fancy mall in Denver and walk around Neiman's or Saks or whatever they have down here, down there and inspect the clothes. I doubt they have Airdem, but I would like it if they did. And then I can go ahead and set my sleeves in. Once again, I need to pin the side that will be on the outside of the tulip first. So that's what I'm doing here. Pinning the front from the underarm to the sleeve cap and in between. And then I will pin the other side because it needs to underlap up by the shoulder seam, just for that layered sleeve effect that the tulip sleeves have. And yes, again, I do think I need to make these sleeves a good inch, inch and a half shorter on the next round. So I, I like these sleeves. I think they have a lot of potential. I just haven't decided my exact perfectly preferred proportions for them yet. So I'll get there. But just laying that backside underneath the front, it overlaps just a little bit up here by the shoulder. And I think actually I will make it overlap a little bit less next time as well. Just experimenting with tulip sleeves and seeing how far I can exaggerate them in different directions. Um, and play with the style a little bit here in the studio lately. Like I've said, this is the one time where I am just going to sew over my pins because it's near the end of the project first of all, and second of all, it's just so fiddly to set in the sleeve. So for ensuring success, I will go ahead and make an exception and sew over them. And now it is time for me to set my zipper into the back of this dress. So I'm gonna see how far that zipper tape comes down the back, and then I will pin the skirt together from there down near the hem. Of course, I will leave about eight inches free at the hem so that I can have a slit back there to facilitate walking. Uh, my pencil skirt isn't too narrowed in this at all. Um, so it's more of a straight skirt, so I, I could probably still walk slowly, even if I didn't do a slip back here. But just in case I ever need to, like, grab a cab, you know, or something in my imaginary city life that I do not have, um, you know, it's good to have a slip back here. And my seam allowance down my center back is, of course, one inch as usual. So I'm going to go ahead and use my hem gauge to make sure that the rest of this is pressed back that same inch, again, along the um, corsety bits center section here. I didn't sequin this last inch and a half or so, so that I could do this easily without having sequins in the way or melting them on accident, anything like that while ironing. Do be careful with sequins because they are just plastic and your iron gets very hot and you do got to be careful. But yes, just using my hem gauge to make sure I press back the seam allowance for both edges of the back before I try and set this onto a zipper, uh, kind of set the zipper in and set the dress on. I will be sewing the first side of the lapped zipper I'll be doing down the back of this with the machine and then I will actually hand stitch down the other side. And I did go ahead and decide to interface a lot of the seam allowance along the back here too just for extra stability along the zipper tape where that's going to be sewn down. Again, if I have one regret about this dress it's that I didn't interline the black brocade portions uh, but you know, c'est la vie. Uh, what are you going to do once it's this done? I could take the whole darn thing apart. That's not going to happen ever. I really couldn't take the whole darn thing apart. It's just the kind of thing that you learn as a lesson for next time. This brocade is just a little bit looser weave that I'm used to, and therefore a little bit wiggly and needed probably an extra layer of stability. Although this dress would be even more, I don't know, substantial and kind of wintry, <laughs> very warm, if I were to have added in a whole other layer like that. But yes, I will go ahead and pin the first side, the right-hand side of my dress opening back here now that everything is right side out. 
along the zipper on my zipper tape and I will actually stitch this down again on the machine and then the other side the overlapped side of my lapped zipper I will actually hand stitch so something that again I will not show you I've shown that technique in my zipper video so you can check that out in this video if you want to know what I'm doing it's much easier to see in that example than it would be in a sparkly fabric like this one so I rely on referring you to past me who is showing you an example of how to do that as opposed to walking you through me doing it while working with weird sequin textured brocade fabric because no one's going to see those stitches. But yes, on the machine I have my zipper foot so I can do this first side, stitching right through the folded edge of my dress down into the nylon zipper tape as it were. And no, I never use invisible zippers. Uh, I mean, obviously the look once they're properly inserted is very nice. However, I have found in my experience that invisible zippers break more easily than a traditional zipper and to have to rip an invisible zipper out and replace it with something, no. So I would rather just use a regular zipper because I feel they're a lot more reliable and less likely to break over time. But here I am overlapping that other side and pinning it into place just so that this folded edge overlaps the stitching line from the first side of the zipper. Again, we're not overlapping a lot here. We're not losing any sizing in the dress itself. It's, you know, less than an eighth of an inch of overlap here. And then I will backstitch this side down to the zipper tape underneath so that it is nice and secure against my zipper. Now my sleeves may be fully lined, but it's time to insert the lining into the rest of this dress. And to do so, I'm going to attach it at the neckline. So I'm going to grab my lining here, which of course is sleeveless, again, because the sleeves are already lined. And I'll pin that right sides together along the neckline here, like so, and stitch that on. This will be the main connection point between these two layers, funny enough. So I'll just stitch that on. Of course, the curves along this and the v-neck itself right here at the point will need to be clipped before I can turn this right side out. I will actually throw in a couple of extra stitches right at this v uh, very carefully to make sure that that is reinforced because I will be clipping this V later, momentarily, very soon. Like so. And then a couple of clips back here where it's curvy. And then I can turn this right side out, give it a press, and then I will actually do again some understitching to make sure that this lining stays on the inside because although it's a coordinating sort of taupey beige silvery color that works with the brocade. I don't want this to be seen up here along the black brocade of the neckline. So I will press this a little bit, but then I will take it back over to the machine and throw in some understitching. The only problem with this lining is that it is so very thin. Uh, acetate linings are crispier than rayon, uh, so that makes them actually a little bit easier to work with, but this one is very thin and like any sort of wiggle or pull will show in this sort of thing. So it's lucky it's the lining and on the inside, you know? So no one needs to know if it's not absolutely smooth and perfect. All right, understitching is in. Just give that neckline a final press here. Make sure everything is staying nice and finished like so. And then I'll turn everything inside out, being careful because of all those sequins. And I've kind of finger pressed this lining already so that it has a bit of a uh, seam allowance indication here. And I will pin that along the zipper tape on the inside here so that I can hand stitch this, hand slip stitch this into place along the zipper tape so that everything inside is nice and smooth and hidden behind the lining. Because what's the point of a lining if it doesn't hide all of the uh, sewing sins here? So let's pin that along the zipper tape and then along the seam allowance down to the bottom of the slit, I'll leave the last few inches free down there, and I'll show you why later when it comes to hemming this. But I'll do the same for the other side, and then again, I will sit and hand stitch this down into place. And once that is finished, it will look like this. And like I said, every tiny little uh, wiggle or pucker in that uh, acetate lining will show along that back seam, but it, the functionality is what's important, not the perfection of the satiny lining here. I will go ahead and clip the curves around the arm side of my lining because I'm going to because I need to fold this in on itself so I can finish the arm side 
between the two different types of lining here. So just because of how I set the sleeves in and the fact that the sleeves kind of have pleats at the top meant that I couldn't do the lining of the sleeve as part of the lining of the dress. Hopefully you understand what I mean. If you've lined, in f if you've lined a few dresses in your time, then you probably do. Um, but this means I'm going to have to turn the inside of this along and then I will again hand stitch this into place so that there's no raw edges around my arm side anymore. Um, so I'm just turning that in on itself like so and then I will slip stitch this down by hand. A lot of the lining, the finishing for the lining on this is done by hand in general. So, eh, you know. Also, it was a bit bulky up here at the shoulder cap, so I snipped some of the seam allowance away just to remove a little bit of that bulk. I didn't put any shoulder pads in this one, but between the uh, brocade and the lining and the puff of the sleeve, I think it has a strong enough shoulder all on its own. And then we have this lovely uh, epically shot, super cinematic, blurry footage of me turning my hem. I did hem the brocade layer and the lining layer separately, and then I tacked them together just in case this brocade, being a wily one, decides to stretch more than the lining in the future. I wanted to be able to reach through the hems easily without them being connected, so I do have these just kind of floating in here. I'll show you that in a moment in an actual clear shot. What a wild idea. But here's how those arm size turned out after I had slip stitched those. So as you can see, it's a bit pillowy in here, but at least it's nice and satiny smooth against my arm, and therefore will not be irritating in any way or fray any further or anything like that. Nice and finished in there. And then my hems look like this. So I have this tacked at the side seams and then each hem is done separately. So I have a thread tack here, holding the lining into place. And I finished stitching the lining down to the fashion fabric at the slit at the end after I had hemmed these and turned them both up. And as you can see, I did hem the lining layer a little bit shorter than the rest of the dress so that it would stay hidden and out of the way. And after a full week of sewing on sequins, here is my finished dress. I'm super pleased with how this came out. It is very, very sparkly. Even the brocade is quite shiny and sparkly, let alone the entire sequined midsection. And did I have time to sort of drop everything else and completely sequin a kind of semi-couture dress for myself for no particular reason? No, no, I did not. In some ways, I think this is what I would have worn if I were invited to the Barbie premiere. I could be Bug Barbie, you know, the, the glamorous entomologist. And this is actually only part one of a two-part ensemble because I had an idea for another sort of item to add on to this ensemble, and you'll be seeing that next week. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed seeing how this project came together today, and thank you as always for watching. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon, so I'll see you then. Bye!